All right, it looks like we're just turning to four o'clock. Um, so, and people are joining. I can see. Welcome to all of you who are joining us on Facebook and joining us here uh, on Zoom. Uh, just before we get, I introduce our distinguished speaker this week, we're going to begin with some of our usual introductory slides. We'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement. Crow Canyon acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our campus sits. Our work is not possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. We are grateful to all indigenous people and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Thank you to everyone for your support of our mission. We can't do it without you. Um, just a couple quick Zoom reminders. Um, you can put your questions uh, in the Q&A at any time, and we will get to them during the Q&A session. Uh, they might get lost in the chat if people get to chit-chatting. Uh, if Zoom is giving you a headache, you can hop over to our Facebook page where we are live streaming, and you'll be able to see this in our past lectures on our YouTube channel. So please subscribe. Uh, we have some fantastic webinars coming up. I know I say that every week, but it's true. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we have a really um, hot and relevant webinar next week uh, on climate history and indigenous futures, climate adaptation for contested landscapes with Dr. Lindsay Schneider. Uh, and the week after that, uh, my longtime uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Potter, talking uh, about work that he did on Native American life at Mission Santa Clara de Asis Rancheria uh, in Southern California. So please join us the next couple of weeks for these webinars as well. Huge, huge, huge thank you from all of us at Crow Canyon. Uh, our webinar series is entirely free. And the reason that we can do that is because of all of you who donate to Crow Canyon, who donate uh, every time you register for a webinar. We are so grateful for all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some fun things on the website or and uh, in, 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 in your snail mail as well. We have our spring newsletter is out with some updates on work of our research institute, our educational programs, um, a tribute to our recently passed longtime board member, Ron Laramore, um, and some, some more information about how to support Crow Canyon. So please check out our website for some new information if you have not been there recently. Without further ado, I'm really excited uh, and to both introduce and to hear from our speaker uh, this week. Dr. Terry Hunt is an internationally renowned anthropologist, archaeologist, and educator. He is one of the world's for foremost experts on the human environmental histories of the Pacific Islands, where he has conducted research for more than four decades in the field, and just as recently as a few months ago and going back soon. Uh, Dr. Hunt is the author of The Statues That Walked, Unraveling the Mystery of Easter Island, which won the Society for American Archaeology's Book Award in the public audience category. Uh, Dr. Hunt's research was the focus of a National Geographic magazine cover story in July 2012 and a Nova National Geographic TV documentary that first aired on PBS in November 2012. He earned his bachelor's at the University of Hawaii, his master's at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, uh, and his PhD from the University of Washington. And he is currently a professor at mine and many of our other archaeologists, Alma Mater's uh, University of Arizona. Welcome, Dr. Hunt. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Okay. Perfect. Looks great. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Perry. And, and thanks to Crow Canyon uh, for uh, sponsoring the talks and, and all that you do in education. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, talk about our, our research. And um, I'm happy to share uh, the work that we've been doing on Easter Island, or as I'll refer to it, um, Rapa Nui. Well, uh, Rapa Nui is in the southeastern Pacific. It is remote. It is isolated. It's about 2,300 miles from the mainland of South America, Chile in particular. The nearest occupied island is Pitcairn, and that's about 1,300 miles away. 
And further uh, to the west is Tahiti, about 2,600 miles away. So it is truly isolated, truly remote, and it is really small. The island is about 14 miles by eight miles wide, and you can see the in entire island here. Um, it's a, the, the relief is fairly low, and um, as you can see, the uh, landscape is largely grassland uh, deforested, but we'll be talking about that. Well, there's an interesting uh, paradox about Rapa Nui, and that is that, as I mentioned, it's small, it's remote, it's isolated. It has limited and even unpredictable resources, and it had a small population at the time Europeans arrived on the island. And with all of that, it has almost 1,000 giant megalithic statues called Moai. This is a really grand scale of cultural exuberance that rivals really anywhere in the world in terms of sort of the per capita, uh, per capita investment in monumentality and statuary um, works. There are approximately a thousand of these statues that I just mentioned. Um, they are carved, most of them, at this main quarry at Ranoraku. And then they are transported to every corner of the island. The average statue is about 14 tons, but they range from about 5 tons to 82 tons. And a statue named Paro, weighing about 82 tons, the largest ever transported, was transported about three miles from the quarry. So it wasn't really a short distance to transport a statue that's 82 tons. That statue is over 10 meters tall or over 33 feet tall. <clears throat> and so the transport of these statues to every part of the island is, is really um, phenomenal, really uh, you know, mind boggling um, when you think about it. Some of the statues uh, weighing uh, many tons were transported as far as a minimum of about 11 miles, but perhaps up to 14 miles, depending on the route that they took. These are really um, count as uh, mysteries uh, for Rapa Nui and has really captivated uh, the world's attention. The island is also famous as a cautionary tale of our own global resource and environmental problems. <clears throat> As Jared Diamond uh, outlined in his book Collapse, in his uh, really um, key chapter for his argument um, about Rapa Nui, he argued that Rapa Nui is the clearest example of a society that destroyed itself by overexploiting its own resources. Part of this argument was that the island was also overpopulated and that making all of these statues was actually part of kind of a, a mania, a Moai mania, a craziness that obsessed the islanders and led to their, their downfall. Well, the island was once covered in palm trees like these on the Chilean mainland, um, millions of palm trees. Uh, and we see them on the mainland today a very similar or even the same species would have grown on the island. Uh, and perhaps European um, who, Europeans who visited the island the first time may have seen a few of these palms, but the island was largely uh, deforested. By the time <clears throat> by the time the Dutch arrived in 1722, um, they uh, they saw a deforested island and 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 wondered what had happened. And this led to, this was the beginning of speculation. More speculation came with um, Captain James Cook in particular, um, who really speculated about the island must have been more, uh, there must have been more abundance in the past and that something terrible had happened. The island was, of course, then mostly deforested by the time the Dutch arrived on the island. So was this a reckless destruction of limited resources? Was it overpopulation? Was it over exploitation? 
Um, did transporting the giant moai play a role in, in deforestation? Well, Polynesians arrived on the island around 1200 AD. They migrated from central eastern Polynesia and the archipelagos of the Marquesas, the Tuamotus, and the Australs uh, are, are likely points of origin. We can't pinpoint it yet, but um, probably a migration that moved through those areas. And finally, uh, with the discovery of Rapa Nui and the colonization around 1200 AD. With colonization, Polynesians brought with them the plants that they cultivated, so they were agriculturalists, and they also brought with them, in the case of Rapa Nui, chickens and rats. Other Polynesian islands had also had pigs and dogs, but pigs and dogs never seemed to show up in Rapa Nui. Well, about deforestation, the impacts of Polynesian arrival would have begun on day one, um, pretty much literally. Polynesians introduced rats either accidentally or on purpose, and rats would eat the seeds of native trees. And in fact, the native palms on the island produce edible nuts, and they have been called rat candy by bi biologists, and the rats would eat these seeds. And you can see these rat gnawed seeds in the slide here. Um, these are ancient nuts from Rapa Nui, and evidence that uh, rats played a major role in deforest in the island. Now, how could they do this? When they eat the seeds of native plants and the palms in particular, they are uh, preventing the regeneration of the forest. So deforestation could occur slowly as regeneration failed as the seeds were um, eaten. So all the rats have to do is eat a lot of seeds. Regeneration is slowed and uh, the forest would not regenerate at the same rate that it had um, prior to rats being there. Um, so rats have a great impact and they've, they've had impacts on other islands, but the other islands are not quite as small and ecologically um, simple, I guess we could say sort of limited diversity on Easter Island given its size. And so rats could have a, a huge impact. And I want to share with you something kind of startling. Under ideal conditions, um, we can calculate that a population beginning with a male and female rat can double their population every 47 days. Um, and that means that with that single mating pair, rats could reach a number of 17 million in about 1,128 days. That's just over three years. So the impact would be great. There were no predators, unlimited food, the number of rats uh, on Rapa Nui uh, probably reached about uh, several thousand, uh, maybe into the millions, uh, very quickly and would have had an impact on the vegetation. Well, of course, fire played a role as well, because when humans arrived, they would use fire to clear land for um, agriculture. <clears throat> and what we have on Rapa Nui is really the transformation of a natural environment into an agricultural environment. Something that's happened all over the world is the reason why we're all here is because our, our ancestors cleared land and planted crops and, um, and really expanded population, et cetera, everywhere in the world. Um, Polynesians uh, used indigenous, um, in, excuse me, indigenous and ingenious uh, methods such as rock mulch uh, that improved growing conditions for their crops. The rock mulch would really mitigate problems with nutrient poor soils, seasonality, drought, um, wind, etc. And this adaptation really, along with others, really made Rapa Nui a sustainable society for more than 500 years. In 1722, the first Europeans arrived on the island uh, with the Dutch expedition of uh, Jacob Ro Rogovin. Jacob Rogovin and his men described the island as, I'm going to read a quote from them, as, quote, exceedingly fruitful, producing bananas, potatoes, sugarcane of remarkable thickness, and many other kinds of fruits of the earth, although destitute of large trees and domestic animals, except poultry. 
this place, as far as its rich soil and good climate are concerned, is such that it might be made into an earthly paradise if it were properly worked and cultivated, which now is only done insofar as the inhabitants are obliged to for the maintenance of life, unquote. The Dutch called Rapa Nui an earthly paradise, not a place that had been ravaged by uh, something like ecological suicide. Um, they also make the very interesting comment that people are only uh, cultivating as many crops as they need to, uh, to subsist on the island, suggesting that the population was really in equilibrium, in balance, in a sustainable way with what the environment um, could produce. Well, what actually happened in Rapa Nui history, um, in prehistory? Well, um, we can look at this uh, graph that uh, is a um, result of our recent research, and we can see that uh, demography, in terms of demography, there would have been a, a rapid rise in population, but it would have stabilized. And the only population loss that occurred was not due to ecological change, but came with European contact. The palm forest would decline, Palm forests would be replaced with agricultural uh, land and cultivation of crops. And an added uh, paleo environmental factor from settlement to the island, the first Polynesians faced rather wet conditions. And then after about 1500 AD, drier conditions. So they had to further adapt to, to climate change. But there was really no ecocide. The, the loss of population came with old world diseases and um, the impacts of uh, European contact. Um, <clears throat> ecocide has been popular and made popular by, by Jared Diamond and other authors, but it's important as we look at the history of the island from European contact to realize that a near genocide devastated the native Rapa Nui population uh, and it was a result of European contact. And really, if we are claiming ecocide, it's an attempt to blame the victims as perpetrators of their own demise, really not what happened. So that's kind of the first um, chapter of talking about the, the, the study of the island and our work there and our, our new understanding of the island. And much of what we have discovered is that the evidence for some sort of ecological catastrophe that had an impact on the culture and people of the island just didn't happen. Well, what about the Moai? Um, how were these giant statues transported from the quarry on one part of the island to every part of the island, sometimes several miles? Well, <clears throat> my colleague uh, Carl Lippo and I uh, when we began work on the island in the year 2000, we we promised ourselves, we made sort of a pact that um, we would never study how the Moai were transported. Um, there were too many wild theories. We thought we would never really know the answer. And we wanted to focus our efforts on research where we would know the answers. Um, and the next slide maybe says it all, wild theories, speculations. We just thought, let's stay away from this. And uh, we're going to just uh, focus, you know, get put our put our heads down and do the work and learn about the, the archaeology on the island. Well, how the Moai were transported has been of interest to researchers for quite some time. In 1955, um, Thor Heyerdahl, uh, speculated on a couple of uh, methods of transport. One of them was using a, a sled like this, and the other was simply um, dragging it over bare ground. Um, neither one of these really worked very well. He, he attempted dragging a moai with about 300 villagers across uh, the beach at Anakena, a uh, sandy area. Most, you know, 99.99% .99 of the island is not sandy, it's rocky and hilly, and um, dragging it simply wouldn't work. The Moai would be destroyed. Um, <clears throat> by the 1980s, a Czech engineer named Pavel Pavel uh, decided to try this with a kind of a Moai facsimile, 
um, this block of concrete that was shaped a little bit like a Moai, and you'll understand why I'm um, hedging on that, as I say, a little bit like a Moai as we as we go into more detail. But he tried uh, leverage and rolling on logs and di didn't really work. Um, and this was in what was then Czechoslovakia. Um, he he later would later come to the island. Um, meanwhile, uh, there are another there are other attempts, kind of using Heyerdahl's uh, method of a sled, but on log rollers, and the rollers on top of kind of log rails. So uh, three layers of logs there, or two layers of logs with the sled, and then pulling it with ropes. Um, this kind of works. Um, but as I as I like to uh, remind people, what we can do doesn't mean that's what they did. And in fact, we have to really pay close attention to the archaeological evidence, not just what is feasible for us, because actually one of the best ways to move a Moai is with a hydraulic crane and a truck. But obviously, that's not what they did. So it's important to look at the materials they had and the evidence that's on the ground. And we will be looking at that. Uh, Pavel Pavel came to the island um, and tried something different. He tried uh, moving a moai in a vertical position. And why vertical position? Um, Heyerdahl and Pavel Pavel were curious about uh, vertical position because the oral tradition on the island says that the statues walked. If you ask Rapa Nui people today, how did your ancestors move the moai? is a very simple answer. They walked. So Pavel wanted to try this. They took a Moai that had once been on a platform. Please make a mental note of that. We'll come back to it. Uh, they put some grass padding on it. They had several ropes and they shuffled the Moai um, over the ground. And within just uh, a few feet, they were damaging the Moai. It was grinding the base. It was very difficult to move. And it really, um, it really discouraged uh, people from trying anything in a vertical position. They just said, okay, well, it's it's been attempted and it doesn't work. So the statues couldn't have walked as the Islanders say, or metaphorically so, it must be something else. So it gave it kind of a bad name. Charlie Love, an experiment in Wyoming, uh, tried moving a Moai facsimile and, and uh, tried kind of putting the moai on logs and then on rollers and then pulling it. Again, this kind of works, but uh, pretty, uh, doesn't, doesn't work so well. And it's also pretty treacherous. Well, um, it's that background that we said, okay, let's, let's leave the moai transport uh, alone. Let's not, let's not worry about it. And in the meantime, uh, we began to do really extensive work across the island every year beginning in 2000. And one thing we produced was a, a Moai inventory of almost a thousand Moai from everywhere on the island. And this allowed us to collect a lot of details about Moai form, location. Uh, students were engaged in this research and here they are recording with GPS, uh, a small Moai. Um, this uh, this locational data would allow us to map uh, Moai in relation to the quarry, their transport all over the island, and it would allow us to um, really put everything together in this view of the island um, and a, a map that had never been uh, produced before. The blue triangles here are about 400 Moai that are still in the quarry at Ranoraku, and we'll take a look at those. The green circles are more than 500 moai that are found all around the island. So you can see how extensive their transport was. Many of them are on the shoreline, but they're also in the interior. Um, the red stars you see here are about 60 moai that were being transported. And the dashed lines you see here with the red stars up here on the north coast and two red stars up here, down here. These are the remnants of the ancient Moai transport roads. We first saw these roads um, in satellite images and then we ground truth and mapped them uh, 
walking the roads and um, documenting the features along the roads. You'll notice here that <clears throat> in the center of the island, they sort of get truncated, the ends, the roads end, and yet we have some moai out here and moai that were transported across this region. Uh, this area is an area that today is used for farming. And so uh, the, the agricultural fields there have destroyed the, the ancient roads. Um, but you get the entire picture here, quarry, transport, uh, place of final display on the platforms called um, Ahu. Let's look at the parts of this sequence. This is the quarry at Ranoraraku. It is a volcanic uh, cone that has a volcanic ash uh, deposit that cemented itself um, together and formed an aggregate kind of soft rock that has inclusions in it, like lava bombs that come down as the volcanoes erupting. And the moai are carved out of the bedrock. You can see a moai here. Uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about him in a minute. Um, and you can see the carving out of the moa uh, out of the quarry area here at Raraku. And we're going to look at uh, parts of the quarry here. So a little closer up, this uh, moa is uh, named Te Tokanga. He is the largest in the quarry. He is almost twenty two meters tall. That's I think seventy one feet. Um, he was never completed. He's still in the bedrock. But this is the um, the kind of uh, massive uh, moai production and transport that the islanders were planning, at least. And they had already moved an 82-ton moai, about half uh, this size, um, more than three miles to its location where it was displayed on a platform. But you can see the carving here um, uh, in the quarry. When we take a closer look, uh, you can see areas that have been carved out, quarried out. And here there's a moai in here. There are moai over in here, if you follow where my cursor is. More moai being carved up here. Everywhere you look, you see areas that are cut, or you see more moai. You see a little uh, eroded face down here, a body being cut down here, another block over here. It's absolutely astonishing to see the hundreds of moai in the quarry that are in various stages of production. And what the quarry represents is it wasn't a moment when everyone, something like Pompeii, where everyone dropped their stones and stone tools and ran away. Um, there's chronology in the, in the quarry. There are moai that were never finished for various reasons. There are old moai that were never finished. There are young, more recent moai that were never finished. So the quarry has its own chronology and its own diversity. And there are many stories to tell as we study the quarry further. Here's a closer look. You can see, uh, look at this cutting away from the, the bedrock here and carving away um, Oops, there we go. Carving carving uh, these moai in every which way. There's a little one here, bigger one here, another one up here. Uh, it's just amazing. Another one down here. And on a pretty steep part of the cliffs of the uh, cinder cone at Raraku, look at this area of the quarry. A block here where a moai has been removed, another block here that's being carved, a moai, a moai. And then look at this stack of moai in this steep cliff. This is a vertical cliff on the right side and then carving in the quarry here. We are actually um, able to see these details by um, using um, small drones that uh, are useful in documentation. And on the inside of the quarry, on the steep interior slopes, also moai being carved out of the bedrock and just for scale, you look down here at the shoreline. This is the largest ahu or platform on the island with 15 moai at Ahu Tongariki. So really spectacular. Look at this moai over here on the steep slopes on the interior of the, of the cinder cone. You can see here uh, two moai being carved, a, uh, a nose here face, another head, nose, forehead here. And on the bedrock here, 
you can actually see the scars of stone tools that are used to chip away at the uh, bedrock to carve these uh, moai out of the bedrock. So after the moai are carved up here in the bedrock, they are brought down the slope, <clears throat> probably slid down on their backs and dropped into an excavated uh, hole or trench. And I'll show you in a diagram, but this is the second stage. After they're carved, they're, they're broken off of the rock and brought slid down the slope and then left standing in these pits. This is the first time the Moai go from uh, horizontal to vertical position. Here's what that looks like. Uh, carving out of the bedrock here with A. Uh, there's a keel left on the base, and this is the last part to be broken off. Um, and then the Moai is slid down, probably usually using gravity, although we don't know all the details of this, dropped into a pit, bringing it into a vertical position. And what happens is that on a slope like this, all you have to do then is excavate the front of the vertical pit and you can move the moai out in a vertical position as you see in C. D is what happens when the moai in the pit is never moved, it's abandoned for whatever reason and a sedimentation occurs and the, the moai get buried up to their necks. Thus the kind of uh, misunderstanding that the moai are heads, not statues and the misunderstanding that was popular a few years ago. Oh, the the statues have body. They, oh, excuse me, the heads have bodies. Well, we've always known that. Um, so this is kind of a diagram of what that looks like. Um, then the the moai are moved out along uh, roadways, leaving the quarry. Here we see several heading downhill away from the quarry, and we see in this case these two are broken at the neck. This one is complete. Up here, this one is broken at the neck. Another one here. This is bedrock here, but they're they're coming down from the quarrying area onto roadway. Here's another one, a really large moai heading out. These will head out to uh, roads, and here we see two. Um, in fact, these are also uh, broken, and um, one in the foreground is at kind of an interesting angle. We'll talk about that. And then out on the roadways, we see moai that. Um, have uh, failed in their transport. And it begins to look, I'm gonna show you the evidence, but it begins to look like we have very clear evidence for the Moai being transported in a vertical position. We also have uh, remnants of the road. This is on the North coast. And you can see these stone alignments in this relatively cleared area. This is one of the Moai roads and we take a closer look, you can see the Moai Road here. We can find traces of the Moai Road in, in different parts of the island. And in some parts of the island, you can actually hike along the Moai Road, see the road constructed features, see the, the Moai that have been abandoned there, etc. It's a very interesting way of studying how the uh, Moai were transported. And on the south coast, here we get a high uh, drone view. This is the Moai Road going off all the way, and this is the quarry. Um, and the Moai Road here <clears throat> takes a couple of forms. Here you can kind of see it in the um, slope here with curb stones. And then here you can see a line of stones. What's happening here is that it's a depressed area and with uh, livestock uh, and gravity, the boulders roll into the depression and form a line. And so in satellite images and from drone shots, you can actually see the road alignments by seeing lines of rocks that have uh, fairly recently um, rolled into these depressions that are the roads, at least in areas where the road beds are depressed and kind of U-shaped. Well, the Moai roads really give us evidence for transport. And I'll just mention again, Carl and I said we're not going to study transport, but we were seeing all of this evidence and we realized that maybe we were seeing things that were sort of, you know, screaming out to us. One thing is that um, many of the Moai on the roads are broken. Um, 
and they're broken in a way that um, suggests that they fell. The head, for example, or the pieces that broke are sometimes a distance from the rest of the body. It is hard to imagine if a moai was being moved on its back on logs, how the moai would get into this position. Um, why are they in this position and how did they break in this way? The first intuitive response here is that, oh, they fell and they broke when they fell. Um, they also have um, fractures on the bases, on the lateral sides, that suggests um, pressure from them standing and moving and the stone breaking under that pressure. We also saw something very interesting as we looked at all of the, all the data that we had collected along the roads, is the non-random position of the fallen moai. When the moai were going uphill on the roads, you want to guess? They were on their backs. When they were headed downhill on the roads, they were on their faces. When they were on flat ground, they were more often on their face, but it was a little more variable. Sometimes they had sort of fallen even on their side. We looked at this data and we realized that this was telling us that the moai were moved in a vertical position. We didn't know exactly how, but how else could we account for this, this evidence. Here is the, the fractured base. You can see it here. This is a 3D model of a, of a fallen moai. You see it's face down. This is, this is heading down a slight downhill slope on the road. And I'll show you that uh, fractured base in the next slide. But the base here has, has broken off here, right here, and then in the next slide, this area broke. Um, why and how does that breakage occur if the statue is moving on logs? What is that telling us about transport? The moai on the roads also have an angled base. They lean forward uh, some uh, 10, 12, 15 degrees. This one has a forward lean of 15 degrees. Um, Another moai, this one uh, about 12 degrees uh, forward lean. Um, this is a characteristic of moai that were being transported. This one 10 degree forward lean base that also broke. Um, the moai on the platforms do not have a forward lean. And in fact, the moai on the roads have such a forward lean that they would not be able to stand up on their own. They would fall forward. This idea has the virtue of being consistent with oral tradition. In fact, the Rapa Nui language even has a word, neke neke, which translates as walking with no legs. For centuries, we have known that the Moai did walk, as our ancestors said. But how exactly they did the walking is what we, the archaeologists, are looking into. It. In fact, others have tried to move them vertically including Thor Heyerdahl and a Czech engineer named Pavel Pavel. This is the statue that uh, Pavel Pavel tried to move in 1986 with his experiments, uh, moving this, the statues in an upright position. By shuffling it across the surface, there was a lot of friction on the base. And as he did it, in fact, there was damage done to the base that removed material right down from the bottom here. We thought this can't really be quite right because the, the shuffling and the grinding could, isn't consistent with the, what we saw in the statue. So on the one hand, we were like, yes, they're moving standing up, but not exactly that way. To figure out a less destructive way to move them, they built on observations first made by Sergio Rapu, identifying differences between statues that made it to the platform and those that fell on the way. On the more than 50 fallen statues they analyzed, what researchers called road moai, the eyes hadn't been carved yet. They were left as sharp angled slots. According to Hunt and Lippo's measurements, road moai were chunkier, their bases were bigger, their centers of gravity were lower, kind of like a bowling pin. Most of the road moai had a D-shaped base, and the base was angled so the statue leaned forward. These were key features to Lippo and Hunt. The 
statues were rolled across the front edge. Uh, and that front edge has a characteristic shape, especially as the statues get larger, that allowed that to happen. The statues that made it to the Ahu platform show the difference. The eyes had been carved, their sides had been trimmed, and their center of gravity shifted back and up. They'd been cut so that their bases were no longer angled, but flat. They leaned forward, but not as far as road moai. They stood more upright, and they'd lost a little weight. Based on all these differences, the difficulties faced by the Czech engineer Pavel are understandable. Pavel was using a statue that had already been reshaped for a platform. The eyes had already been carved. It didn't lean as far forward, and its sides had been trimmed. Ultimately, the evidence for how the statues were moved can be found on the statues themselves. They were engineered to move, and the details of the statues are telling us about transport. So I, I share that clip from the um, National Geographic uh, documentary from 2012 uh, with you because it illustrates nicely the features of uh, road moai. And it can be summarized here. The, the moai on the roads have not had the eyes carved yet. It was probably a ritual um, ending where the eyes were carved and then the eye sockets were placed as the moai um, symbolically came alive on the platforms. The uh, the center of gravity is uh, lower on the road moai with a with more uh, mass in the lower part of the uh, statue, and there's a forward lean um, to the statue. Once the moai reached the platform, the eyes were carved. The center of gravity shifted upward by removing some of this mass in the base of the statue, and the base had to be uh, flattened so that the moai could stand in a, a vertical position. What this means is that the moai on the roads are actually not finished, but they are in a state best suited to uh, transport. Well, <clears throat> this is what we knew. Um, we'd put all of this together uh, when we wrote our book. And, um, we originally didn't think we would even talk about Moai transport. As I've, as I've mentioned, we weren't going to study it. And as we were writing our book, our, our, our very uh, competent editor in New York said, you guys, you, if you're going to write a, a book about Easter Island, you have to have a chapter about how the statues were transported. And we said, well, we don't really know. Um, you know, we, we don't really want to speculate. And she said, well, you need to figure it out. And so I think we figured it out. And what I've just shown you is what we knew up to that point. As the book was being published, uh, we were talking to National Geographic about the documentary. And National Geographic uh, convinced us um, through a lot of discussion and a lot of our disagreement that we should try um, making a model of a statue uh, we had done 3D modeling from Structure for Motion software, lots of photos go into a point cloud to make a 3D model. And we used the 3D model to really, our modeling to understand the shape and form of the MOAI in terms of a MOAI transport. Well, the same technology can be used to make a mold and to make a 3D model. And this is what began to happen. National Geographic, um, began uh, uh, contracting mold making. A perfect mold made from a real moai was produced in Washington state, shipped to Hawaii. Um, we named him Hotuiti, three meters tall, almost almost, uh, almost 10 feet tall, nine, nine something feet tall, five tons. And the concrete has styrofoam added to it so that it has the uh, density of the Rano Raraku um, tough. Well, with uh, we volunteers, attached to the here's statue. what happened. Hunt and Lippo okay. finally have the chance to test their walking theory. Starting out with Team A, I want you to pull just the harder. You keep it constant. Okay, See if we can exciting. rock it a little bit. Ooh. 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 Okay, hold it. Let's see how we go. I want you guys to spread out a little more so that you're holding it, but more at an angle. Does this get harder or, e or it's about the same? Easier? Easier at this angle. I want you to pull team A to pull to see what happens. Pull. Okay. 
All right, hold. How's that? You guys exhausted? Okay. The teams continue to move farther and farther apart, simultaneously pulling and trying to twist the statue. But it's just not working. It's just not working. We spent two days trying to figure this out uh, with lots of volunteers and ropes. And on day two, without much time left for filming, this is what happened. Three ropes, one in the back, one on each side. That is walking, five tons, three ropes. We, we filmed that day and um, I had a clip of this on my um, cell phone, about 30 seconds. And at the end of filming, National Geographic said, strict embargo, no photos, no video, nothing on Facebook. You can't share this with anyone. It won't be on TV for several months. Um, top secret. Well, that night we had a party at my house uh, celebrating actually the publication of our book and the filming of the documentary. And some of my Rapa Nui friends who live in Hawaii were at our house. And uh, one of my friends, I called her over to the corner of my living room quite privately. And I said, I have to show you something. And I showed her the film of the Moai walking on my phone. And she watched it several times. Um, and then she started to sing a song. She put her hands on her side like a Moai. And she sang a song and I said, what's the song? And she said, it's the Moai walking song. Don't you know it? And I said, no, I don't. She said, well, we all learned it as kids. Well, <clears throat> I was a, a, a bit, I was a bit struck by that and um, surprised and excited. And I want to share with you in the rest of the video here, I actually recorded the song and then you'll see the rest of the video of the, of the Moai walking. So the Moai walked, and uh, today um, Islanders have recreated this scene uh, in um, in dance and cultural um, shows uh, and celebrate the Moai walking um, and connecting their 
traditional song that they've all known to knowledge about how the Moai walked. Um, last year on uh, Good Morning America, I was um, uh, fortunate enough to travel to the island with Michael Strahan and and um, this uh, group of Rapa Nui singers performed the Moai walking song um, with a segment about the transport of the Moai that, that I was part of. So it's exciting to see this. We were on the cover of National Geographic in July 2012 and uh, it's been a it's been a great uh, journey. Thank you very much to Crow Canyon Archaeological Center and thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm, I think I saw a few comments in the chat pop up, uh, getting a little weepy there watching watching that happen and uh, and the discovery of the song. Just just incredible. I, uh, I haven't even looked at the Q&A yet, but I, I have to ask about those the, the, the very end of your filming when you when when you finally figured it out and, and it began to to walk and rock in that way. Can you just tell us a little bit more uh, about what that experience was like? It's it, it's the most uh, uh, amazing moment in my entire life. Um, we tried for two days and it was such great frustration and we were really trying to um, understand the forward lean and how the statue was going to fall over if we didn't wedge something under it. And finally with three ropes and, and really teamwork really did it because people had different ideas and it, it was a testament to the value of working with others. Um, it walked and we walked, we watched this five ton Moai walk with ease. The pendulum effect takes over and it's actually quite easy and it's quite fast. We, we moved about, a hundred yards in 40 minutes. Um, it's, it's really astonishing. Was, did you suspect that in the times that you were trying to, to make it work and it wasn't working, were you, were you thinking uh, that that kind of emotion is what you were striving for? Yes. And we were really worried because we thought, you know, when it wasn't working, we sort of said, we don't know how, one, we don't know how to do this. Why, you know, we're archaeologists, <laughs> we can tell you what evidence we have, but we don't know how to move a statue. And we also said, what if the the statue we copied was too eroded? It had been sitting out there for hundreds of years in the elements. Maybe it was eroded and it's the properties were no longer, you know, wouldn't work. So we had lots of doubts. And but actually, when it when it did work, it was kind of like um, a thousand years from now, um, an archaeologist discovers um, an airplane and they wonder what it is and they get in and they turn the key and it flies. And then it's just you realize that it's not really a hypothesis anymore. It's physics. It's this is how it works. And there aren't many other ways that would it would be possible. And so we were really confident when we saw this happen, we realized where the ropes go is exactly where they need to go. You can't put them anywhere else. It doesn't work. The shape has to be right. The forward lean has to be right. And so um, it was astonishing and, and, and yes, highly emotional. And it, it, it still is. And I show this video on the island and an, a full audience of Rapa Nui people will start singing and crying. It's just unbelievable. I can imagine. I just, uh, yeah, there was... There was some some of that uh, crying as as well here. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm I, I'm kidding. I'm actually uh, moderating this webinar uh, 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 in the company of the chair of my board, who has just slipped me an actual question on a piece of paper. Uh, and she, uh, okay, uh, good. So a shout out to. Uh, Liz so Leslie Masson, our, our chair of Car Canyon's board, who's actually been uh, been to Easter Island and and was watching with me, uh, and just also blown away uh, by what you'd accomplished. But uh, asks, has the song uh, been translated, and does it give hints? Uh, because she, as as we were listening to the song, she was saying maybe the the song says tie three ropes around the head, <laughs> and you know. But, uh, anyway. Yes, the song is in Rapa Nui, obviously, and. Um... Hi, Ere Ere, part of the chorus of the song, is referring to uh, making the statue go or walk. And the song references um, an early leader on the island. He's supposed to be part of the one of the chiefs of 
the exploring and colonization uh, group. His name is Tuuko Iho, and Tuuko Iho in the song knows how to make the Moai walk or to go. And one interesting, and then it repeats. Um, and there's an interesting um, line in there about um, how Tuuko Iho uses an anchor stone on the slope. That's a very interesting clue because it's kind of like we know what that is now because because of the forward lean, you actually have to wedge something in the front of the statue if you want to put the ropes down. And on a downward going downhill is the toughest thing of all. Going uphill, and we did more work later. Going uphill is easy. Turning is easy. Um, downhill is really hard because the people in the back have to keep him from falling over. So, yeah, that certainly makes sense. And I'm, I'm going to grab one of the questions out of the Q&A that seems to relate to that from shout out to our friend Susan Markley, who asked, how did the statues end up on a raised platform? Yes, they uh, they actually um, are walked up a stone, the stone ramp on the platform, maybe an earthen ramp. And with the ropes, you can actually turn them around. And then while they're on the platform, you flatten the base and you carve the eye sockets, you finish your work. And uh, it would be the topic of another entire lecture, but then there's a whole method for putting the uh, the pukau or the hat on top of the statue. In one case, an 11 ton hat is placed on top of a 10 meter high statue. Well, yeah. Yeah, just amazing. I'm um, uh, going to get try to get a few more questions in. Uh, here's one from our, our friend Jay Smith. Jay, this is such an archaeologist question. Can you talk about what was used to make the cordage, the ropes uh, used to walk? And are there any archaeological remnants uh, that have been found of the cordage used? A absolutely. There is, um, we have ethnographic knowledge of a plant called Hau Hau. It's a triumfeta um, genus. Uh, and species that's native to the island, not endemic, but native. And it's a woody shrub. And that shrub can be, uh, the, the, the woody parts of that shrub can be made into uh, rope or, or senate. And <clears throat> you can think of all the labor in making the rope. Um, it's sort of like archeologists find fish hooks, but remember all the labor that went into the line, um, things that we don't see. But yes, there was rope technology and remember, um, these were voyagers and and sailors. Uh, they, they had maritime skills um, originally, and so they would know all about rope and and working with fiber. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I feel like we have to ask this question uh, on many people's minds: uh, uh, Is there oral tradition around the meaning of of the statues themselves? Yes, uh, every statue had a name. Um, they are uh, deified ancestors. They represent uh, your uh, your ancestors, and they went to uh, clan-based uh, platforms in clan territories um, where people would, in a sense, commune with them, worship them, um, see them on a daily basis. It's why the Moai face to the interior. They don't have their backs to the people facing out at sea. I think a lot of visitors are surprised that they're not you know, facing out to sea like they're looking for something. No, they're looking at their descendants and they're they're part of pe keeping people um, safe in, in that environment. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, uh, an archeological question around uh, around dating. Um, do you date the stone for the Moai or are there, uh, are there ways to establish some of the chronology there? The no, island? we the island was colonized around 1200 AD. The Dutch arrived in 1722. There's the big window. Mm -hmm. We can't date we can't date the Moai themselves um, because they're stone. We've we've looked at a few methods. The archaeologists will appreciate. We've looked at OSL and some things like that, but they don't have the right um, minerals, so it's not possible. We, we can date activity in the quarry. We can date um, activity on the Ahu. So we have a good picture of Moai. Uh, the Moai business begins pretty early and. Um, lasts uh, probably most of the pre-European period. And actually the Ahu, the platforms are still being reconstructed and maintained after European contact. So um, some of those religious beliefs held on. 
Amazing. Um, so here's a, a question from uh, one of our board members online who's also has traveled with you uh, before. Uh, shout oh. out to Joan Goldstein, who said, whatever happened to the soil samples that you took from under the Moai? Those were the, <laughs> wow, good memory. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, they are, they ended up in Seattle at the at the thermoluminescence lab. That's what we were trying to uh, to date would be the the sediments underneath because OSL, um, uh, optically stimulated luminescent dating, could date minerals in the soil, but it's just not the right minerals there. So it, it, it's not possible now. Fantastic. Well, uh, we want to be respectful of your time uh, for the spectacular presentation. Uh, we are right at five o'clock. Uh, I think I think we got a number of the big the big questions answered. Thank you so much, Dr. Hunt. I think that uh, now everyone watching uh, wants to go uh, with you <laughs> to, to <laughs> Easter Island, and uh, and and uh, I think we'll we will have to to talk to you more to see if we can squeeze into your schedule somehow. Sure. I I I see some questions questions there about going I uh, send me an email if you'd like to learn more I, I, I'm at University of Arizona just drop me an email or if you have questions about the talk I love engaging with uh, interested folks so uh, please feel free wonderful thank you all for watching thank you so much Dr. Hunt incredible incredible moving presentation uh, we're so lucky to to know you and to have you as a friend and colleague thank you very much appreciate it talk to you soon bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.